الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us and we are here today on the 5th of Sha'ban 1442 which is a Friday we continue on with going through the Sheikh Mustafa Hamdu Alayan, his text, clarification of the methodology of Imam Ahmad Hanbal in Creed and Propagation. When we last came together, we were discussing the balance of Imam Ahmad Muhammad on the topic of the companions, Yazid al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, and the understanding that we should have. Let us now carry on from the text. He says, Sheikh Mustafa Hamdu Hulayan, and again, the quote, close quote system is in effect, so if there is clarification needed, I will close the quotes, and those words will be mine, and not the words of Sheikh Mustafa Hamdu Hulayan. The Sheikh has said, quote, وَقَدْ اعْتَرَفَ شَيُوخُ الْشِيعَةِ الْمُصَنِّفِينَ بِمُحَبَّةِ أَحْمَدِ وَمُوَالَاتِهِ لِأَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ فقد قال الوزير الشيعي الزيدي في العواصم والقواصم هذا دليل على شدة موالاته أي أحمد بن حنبل لأهل البيت وقيامه بحق القرابة وقد وصفه بذلك الإمام المنصور بالله الشيعي الزيدي حيث نقل عن أحمد أنه قرئ عليه إسناد مسلسل بأمة أهل البيت فقال لو قرئ هذا على مجنون لبرئ من جنونه And it's been admitted as well by the sheikhs of the Shia who have written of the love of Ahmed and his allegiance to the people of the household of the Prophet So much so that the son of the wazir, the Shi'i wazir, as zaidi has said in the, in the book Al-Awasim Wal-Qawasim This is proof on the stringent allegiance that Ahmed ibn Hanbal had to the household and his establishing the rank that they possess due to their close kinship to the Prophet And this was a description given by that very Imam al-Mansur Billah, the Shi'i Zaydi, in which it was narrated from Ahmed al that someone recited to him an unbroken chain of transmission that had within it the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt. And Imam Ahmed said in reply, had this chain been recited upon someone, demon-possessed or insane, it would have cured him from his ailment. أَمَّا مَحَبَّةُ الْإِمَامِ أَحْمَدْ لِلصَّحَابَةِ فَهُوَ فَهِيَ مَشْهُورَةٌ لَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى تَدْلِيلٌ As far as the love that Imam Ahmed has towards the companions, this is well known and doesn't require a lot of discussion or deriving of proofs from historical accounts. وَقَدْ كَانَ يَرَى عَلَى شِيَعَةِ الْغَالِيَةِ الَّتِي تَسُبُّ الصَّحَابَةِ فَقَالْ وَمَنْ انْتَقَصَ واحد واحدا من من اصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وغض او ابغضه لحدث كان منه او ذكر مساويه كان مبتدعا حتى يترحم عليهم جميعا ويكون قلبه لهم سليما and he used to rebuke the shia that would transgress as well as exaggerate to the point that they curse the companions and he said Whoever found fault with one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or showed enmity to him because of some affair that came from him or mentioned his bad points, such a one is an innovator until he asks for mercy upon all of the companions and blessings and his heart is pure of any rancor towards them. طبقات الحنابل المجلد الأول المجلد الأول الصفحة 44 و and this is taken from Tabaqat al Hanabil of Volume 1, page 244. And Imam Ahmed also said, He also said, The Shia, they say that the people of Sunnah go against the love of the household of Muhammad. They lie. They are the ones that hate the household 
of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anyone else. Inna mashi'atu li ahli Muhammadin al-muttaquna ahli sunnah wal athar. Man kanu wahithu kanu al-lazina yuhibbuna ahli Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa jariya ashabi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa la yathkuruna ahadan minhum bisu'in wa la ibn wa la munqasin. Munqasatin. Well, in fact, it is the Shia that are like this and they accuse the pious ones of Muslim orthodoxy, those who follow the narrations, of that which they themselves are guilty of. But in fact, Muslim orthodoxy, they love the household of Muhammad wasallam and all the companions, and they do not mention any one of them with any evil intent, nor flaw or shortcoming. Tabaqat al-Hanabila al-Majlid al-Awwal al-Sufha 44 wa and this is taken from Tabaqat al Hanabin of Volume 1, page 244. Rashidun. Now we come to the topic of the best of the companions being the rightly guided Khulafa or successors. وَلَا هِيَ أَفْضَلِيَّ مِنْ كُلِّ وَجْهٍ كَمَا صَرَّحَ أَئِمَّةَ الْحَنَابِلَ مُتَأَخِرِينَ مِثْلَ الشَّيْخْ أَبُو بَكْرَ الْخَوَيْقِ الْحَنْبَلِيَّ الْثَرِي مُفْتِي الْحَنَابِلَ فِي الْحِجَازِ فِي بِدَايَةِ الْقَرْنَ الْعِشْرِينَ حِيثُ قَالَ فِي كِتَابِهِ Our madhab is that the best of the companions is Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, then Ali. But this distinction is not decisively stated nor is the preference that we show in all cases that has been, as has been explicitly mentioned by the Imams of the Hanbalis of the latter day generations, like the Sheikh Abu Bakr Khawiqir uh, Al Hanbali Al Athari, who is the Mufti of the Hanbalis in the Hijaz at the beginning of this early century. When he said in his book, مَا لَا بُدَّ مِنْهُ فِي أَمُورِ الدِّينَ عَلَى طَرِيقَةِ السَّلَفِ وَالْإِمَامِ أَحْمَدِ ما معنى تفضيل والأفضلية بين الخلفاء الراشدين هي بمعنى عظم النفع في الإسلام في خلاف في خلافة أبي بكر وعمر رضي الله عنهما كانت على قدم الرسالة في جمع الناس وتألف الكلمة وتدبير الحرب وخلافة عثمان وعلي رضي الله عنهما كانت على قدم النبوة فليست الأفضلية تفضيل الشخص على على رقيقه من جميع الوجوه حتى تعم النصب والشجاعة والعلم ونحو ذلك ولا بمعنى الزيادة الفضل والثواب عند الله تعالى فإنه من الغيب الذي لا يعلمه إلا الله And so he made his statement in his book which he said It's necessary in the affairs of the religion that one follow the way of the first three generations and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Now we must understand what is the meaning of the distinction and the rank that it's given between the different rightly guided Khalifas? It carries the meaning of extreme benefit in Islam. The Khilaf of Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with both of them, was on the steps of Risala, in which the people were gathered together, and one word was kept, and the, the designs of warfare were put out because of this. The Khilafa of Uthman and Ali, may Allah be pleased with both of them, was on the footsteps of prophethood and was of rank as well. The preference given to these is not the preference of a specific individual over his brother in each and every single way possible. Because there are other affairs to consider, such as lineage, bravery, knowledge, and similar things. So it doesn't mean that one of them is in rank over the other in each and every single thing because virtue and reward in the sight of Allah exalted alone and someone's unseen no one can know except Allah glorified and exalted be he and this is taken from his book what's necessary to know of the affairs of the religion upon the way of the first three generations and Imam Ahmed Close quote. So what the Imam is saying here 
And what Sheikh Mustafa Ulayan, Hamdu Ulayan, is quoting here is he's saying that the distinction, the four khulafa in the order that they're given, that rank they've been given. So in general, uh, this is the rank that's given because they're better than each other in general. But there may be some things that someone is closer or better than another one in. Like, for example, Ali ibn Abi Talib, his relation to the Prophet وسلم, is closer than that of Abu Bakr because Abu Bakr is through marriage, but his was through the fact that he is the first cousin of the Prophet So in terms of lineage, he's closer to the Prophet So in lineage, he might be better or more virtuous than Abu Bakr. Omar in some areas may have more rank over Uthman. And then Abu Bakr may have some more ranks in terms of these areas. So in general, Abu Bakr is better than, than Omar. In general, Omar is better than Ali. In general, Ali is better than, right? This is in general. But there are specific things that they outstrip each other in, in terms of their ranks. And that's the point that the Sheikh was making. So now we return to what the Sheikh has said. He said, quote, مَعْرِفَةُ أَحْمَلُ الْحَنْبَوْ بِدَرَجَاتِ الصَّحَابَ وَفَضَائِلِهِمْ now we'd like to speak of Imam Ahmad's knowledge of the different levels of companions and their virtues. Can Imam Ahmad يترحم على جميع الصحابة ويعرف ويعرف بعد ذلك فضل كل واحد منهم ومقامه؟ وحين سئل الإمام أحمد عن الخلفاء الراشدين ذكر الأربعة ولم يدخل معاوية معهم وقد روى ابن عبي يعلى الحنبلي عن إبراهيم بن سويد الأرمي الأرميني قال قلت لأحمد بن حنبل من الخلفاء قال أبو بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي رضي الله عنهم قلت فمعاوية قال لم يكن أحد أحق بالخلافة في زمن علي من علي رضي الله عنه ورحم الله معاوية So Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal used to send mercy upon all the companions and after that he knew the virtue and rank of each one of them and his place So when the Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was asked about the rightly guided khulafa he mentioned the four, and he didn't include Muawiyah with the four. It was narrated by Ibn Abi, uh, Ibn Abi Ya'la al-Hanbali from Ibrahim ibn Suwaydin al-Aramini, who said, I said to Imam Ahmad one day, Who, men al-Khulafa, who are the Khulafa, the rightly guided ones? He said, Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, then Ali. May Allah be pleased with all of them. I said, so then what about Muawiyah? Imam Ahmad said, he was not one of those that was deserving of the Khilaf in the time of Ali. And there was no one more deserving of the Khilaf in the time of Ali than Ali. But may Allah have mercy upon Muawiyah, but he was not one of the four. Tabaqat al-Hanabila al-Mujallad al-Awwal, al-Sufha arba wa tis'een. And this is from Tabaqat al-Hanabila, volume 1, page 94. Fi madhhabina, yurajihu ma amila bihi al-Khulafa al-Rashiduna ala ghayri. And in our madhhab, it should be understood the preference of what was done by the rightly guided khulafa over other of them. Please see the book Al Mukhtasru fi Usul al Fiqh li Ibn al Liham. Please see the sum the summary in Usul al Fiqh by Ibn al Liham, page one seven one, Sharh Sharh al Kawakib al Munir, and Sharh Kawakib al Munir by Ibn al Najjar al Fatuhi, page seven hundred. Wa akhraj al Hafid al Alama Abu al Faraj Ibn al Jauzi. أيضا رحمه الله من طريق عبد الله بن أحمد بن حنبل سألت أبي ما تقول في علي ومعاوية فأطرق ثم قال اعلم أن علي كان كثير الأعداء وفتش عداءه له عيبا فلم يجدوا فعمدوا إلى رجل قد حاربه فأطراه كيادا منهم لعلي إمام and the scholar, the Hafid, the memorizer, Abu al-Faraj ibn al-Jawzi, also narrated from the transmission of Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who said, I asked my father, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, what do you say regarding Ali and Muawiyah? So he paused. Then he said, you should know that Ali had many enemies. His enemies always sought to find some flaw in him, but they couldn't find him. Then they went to another man and they caused problems to the point that they caused him to fight him. And they did wrong towards him and exaggerated. And among those who suffered was Ali ibn Abi Talib because 
the people moved against him and brought enmity. Ibn Jawzi fil Mawdu'at, al Mujallad al Thani, al Sufha Arba wa Ishreen. And this is quoted in al Mawdu'at, volume 2, page 24. Qal al Hafiz wa Amir al Mu'minin al Alam ibn Hajj al Asqalani fi Fatih al Bari. The Hafiz, the leader of the believers in Hadith, the scholar Ibn Hajj al Asqalani, said in his Fatih al Bari, فأشار بهذا إلى مختلف إذا مختلف فأشار بهذا إلى مختلق إذا مختلقوه لمعاوية من الفضائل مما لا أصل له وقد ورد في فضائل معاوية أحاديث كثيرة لكن ليس فيها ما يصح من طريق الإسناد وبذلك جزم إسحاق من رهويه والنسائي وغيرهما. So with regards to the narrative of what was mentioned about what happened with Muawiyah, Muawiyah's ranks and virtues are mentioned, but whenever they are specifically discussed in specific areas, there's no transmission that is authentic, that has an unbroken chain for these. But when he's mentioned in general in his, in his virtues, this is true. There are many a hadith that have been narrated about the virtues of Muawiyah. But this is not one of them because it specifically mentions him. And the transmission that was mentioned is not a transmission of a narration with unbroken chain. And that has been explicitly stated by Ishaq ibn Rahuway and Nasa'i and others besides them. Fatih al-Bari al-Mujallim al-Sabi' al-Sufha and this is quoted in Fatih al-Bari, volume 7, page 104. And these all of these statements have come from Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. And they rebuke the Nasiba firstly, and also the Shiites secondly. The Rawafid have perpetrated lies against Imam Ahmad by trying to fabricate falsehoods that he found, found fault or blame in Ali or the people of the household. May Allah, may Allah have mercy and peace upon them. All of this is lies as well as outright slander. Then you have the Nasiba trying to hide behind the Imam Ahmed as well, with lies, falsehood, and bearing false witness as well. So just understand that we find Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in the middle path between the Shia and the Nawasim. The Shia curse the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and make curses upon them. The Nasiba find fault in the household. May Allah send peace upon all of them. But Imam Ahmed and the Hanabila in total, they send blessing and mercy upon all the companions. And they rebuke and repudiate whoever curses them. And they affirm and establish the Khilafah, the rightly guided Khilafah of Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, then Ali. And they are the best of the companions. And they also affirm and establish the virtues of the people of the household. Peace be upon all of them. And in addition to this, they show enmity towards those who killed Al-Hussein, 
May Allah have his mercies up and his blessings upon him. And they understand that Al Hussein was killed in oppression and he was also a martyr. The Hanabila are silent regarding what occurred between the companions. Although they affirm the rank of the Khilafah of Ali in that matter. But they also, the Hanabila also do not show any fault finding or any rebuke regarding Aisha, Talha, Ibn, Ibn Ubaidullah, Az Zubair al Awam, and Muawiyah. All of them were making ijtihad and seeking the truth. But there were those among them who were mistaken in their ijtihad. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Thalithan, thirdly, وَصَطِيَّةُ أَرَائِهِ فِي مَوْضُوعِ الصِّفَاتِ الْإِلَهِيَةِ بَيْنَ الْجَهَمِيَةَ الْمُعَطِلَةِ وَمُشَبِّتَ الْمُجَسِّمَةِ The middle path of Imam Ahmed's understanding on the subject of the divine attributes, where he walks the middle path between the Jahmiyyah who reject and deny them, and the Mushabi and Mujassima who liken them to the creation. <coughs> موضوع الصفات الإلهية موضوع شائك يتصل باللغة أولا يتصور الإنسان عن إله الذي يعبده واللغة عاجز عن التعبير عن صفات الرب وذهب الإنسان قاصر عن الحاطة الدقيقة بصفات الله تعالى لأن الصفات تتبع الموصوف فكما أن الموصوف هو الله وهو الله لا يحاط به ولا يعرف بحد ولا غاية لذلك صفاته يؤخذ بها بما قد جاء في الشرع من غير تحديد لها أو تنقير عن دقائقها وحقائقها. The subject of the divine attributes is a subject in which it returns to the area of the language firstly. And the human being imagines about the God of all gods that which he worships. But language is incapable of expressing the attributes of the Lord. And the mind of the human being is deficient in encompassing the depth of the attributes of Allah exalted be he. As the attributes follow on from descriptions, just as that the one being described, he is Allah. He is not encompassed by the mind of the human being, nor is he known to have a boundary nor limit. Likewise, his attributes are taken according to what has been mentioned in the revealed law, without boundary for it, without fault finding, and without going into its specifics or its realities. هَذِهِ الْقَوَاعِدُ هِيَ مِمَّا أَخْذَ بِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ قال الإمام النووي في توضيح هذا المذهب عند الشرح أحاديث الصفات And no, these are the rules and foundations which have been taken hold of by the scholars of Muslim Orthodoxy. Imam, Imam Yahya al Nawawi said in clarifying this particular madhab and understanding and explaining the ahadith of Sifat, he said this firstly I'lam anna li ahli al ilmi fi ahadith al Sifat wa ayat al Sifat qawlain. Just understand that. For the people of knowledge on the topic of the ahadith of the sifat and ayat of sifat, there are two statements. Ahaduhuma wa huwa madhabu ma'adhim as-salafi wa aw kulluhum. Anna kulluhum alla yitkallamu fi ma'anah. Bal yaquluna yajibu alina an nu'mina biha wa na'taqidu laha ma'ana yaliqu bi jalalillahi ta'ala. Wa'adhmatuhu ma'a tiqadina al-jazim. أن الله تعالى ليس كمثله شيء وأنه منزه عن التجسيم والانتقال وتحيز في جهة وعن سائر الصفات المخلوق وهذا القول هو مذهب جماعة من المتكلمين واختاره جماعة من محققيهم وهو أسلم The first position, first statement is the statement and way of the vast majority and preponderance of the early generations, or even all of the first three generations, in that they did not speak about the meaning of these names and attributes in the ayat or the ahadith. But they said, it's necessary for us to believe in them and to have firm conviction in them. 
وانا اعتقد وانا اعتقد انه هو جمله اخرى وكذا and it's necessary that we uh, have firm conviction in them according to the fact that they have a meaning in which befits Allah exalted be he and his grandeur with our firm belief that Allah exalted be he there is none like him and that he is exalted from any likeness with the creation movement from place to place or being bound in any direction and from the rest of the attributes and from the rest of the attributes of creation this is also the statement of a group from the theologians and it was the chosen position by a group from the latter day researchers and it is the safest position then there is a second position أنها تتأول على ما يليق بها على حسب مواقعها. This is the method of the great body of theologians in that they interpret according to what is befitting, according to what is known. وإنما يسوغ تأويلها لمن كان من أهله بأن يكون عارفا بلسان العربي وقواعد الأصول والفروع ذا رياضة في العلم and it is only understood to make ta'wil in which someone is qualified and that he knows the Arabic language, the foundations of usul and furu, and he possesses the prerequisites of knowledge. And this is taken from Sharh Sahih Muslim, uh, Sahih Muslim with Sharh Nawawi. This is taken from Sahih Muslim with the Sharh Nawawi, volume 3, page 19. ونسبه إلى المالك والأوزاعي فقال and he also attributed this same understanding to Imam Malik and Awza'i and he said هو مذهب أكثر متكلمين وجماعات من السلف هو محكي عن هنا عن عن مالك والأوزاعي أنها تتأول على ما يليق بها حسب مواطنها and then he said as well this is the method of most of the theologians and groups from the first generations, which has been narrated here from Malik and Al-Za'i, that interpretation is according to what is befitting at the time that's necessary. And I would like to say, تبنني مسألة تأويل على مسألة المجاز وجماهير علماء على وقوع المجاز قال منقح المذهب العلام المرداوي في التحبير الشرح التحرير الصحيح الذي عليه جماهير علماء أن المجاز واقع في اللغة وممن نقل أن العلماء الأئمة الأربعة قالوا بأن المجاز واقع من مفلح في أصولي. So I would also like to say that the principle of ta'wil is built upon the understanding of metaphorical statements. The great preponderance of scholars say that metaphorical statements do occur in the language. Alauddin al-Mardawi author of the Tanqih said in his book on Usul entitled At-Tahbir Sharh Tahrir the authentic position is that which, are, which is held by the great proponents of scholars in that indeed metaphor does occur in the Arabic language and it's narrated that the four Imams also said that metaphor does occur in the Arabic language and this was mentioned by Ibn Muflih in his book Al-Usul وعلى هذا تأول هذا الحديث تأويلين أحدهما تأويل مالك بن أنس وغيرها معناه تنزل رحمته وأمره من ملائكته and on this they this is why they interpret the hadith with two interpretations so مالك بن أنس and others understood the hadith of نزول and saying that his mercy came down or his command معناه, so he interpreted that it came down his mercy his command and his angels بحجة أنها تشبه المخلوق فنفو السمع والبصر والإرادة والكلام والقدرة وهؤلاء هم المعتزلة والجهمية 
Then there are other groups who transgressed the bounds of their positions, among them who declared a law free and exalted to the point that he denied any attribute and any proof from it, because he stated that to affirm any of these attributes is to liken him to his creation. So they denied Allah's hearing, his seeing, his will, his speech, his power. Such people as these are the Mu'tazim and the Jahmiyyah. وَمِنْهُمُ الْمُشَبِّهَ And among them are the Mushabbiha كَالسَّالِمِيَّة Like the Salimiyyah وَالْكَرَّامِيَّة And the Karramiyyah الَّذِينَ بَالِغُوا فِي الْإِثْبَاتِ كَرِدَّةِ فَعَلُوا عَلْ الْمُعَطِّلَةِ And these ones transgressed to where they exaggerated an affirmation of Allah's names and attributes. And it led to tribulation. Just as the tribulation, tribulation Mu'attila. وَعَطَّلُوا اللُّغَ عَنْ مَعَانِيهَا وَأَثْبَتُوا النُّصُوصَ الْمُتَشَابِهَا عَلَى مَعَنَاهَا الْحِسِّ فَوَقَعُوا فِي التَّجْسِيمِ وَالتَّشْبِيهِ They fell into the same tribulations as the Mu'attila who stripped the attributes and denied the language having possessing meanings. But those who were guilty of tajsim and tashbih affirmed the texts according to the meanings that are known, that are sensory meanings. And they fell into liken Allah with his creation and liken the creation with Allah. Qala al shaykhuna shaykh Ismail al-Badran. This is why our shaykh, the shaykh Ismail al-Badran, he said, وَالصَّحِيحُ أَنَّهُ له سمعا وبصرا وإرادة وكلاما وقدرة تليق بجلاله سبحانه وتعالى بلا تمثيل ولا تك ولا تكييف ولا تعطيل وهذا اعتقاد أهل السنة والجماعة والسلف الصالح. And this is why our Sheikh, the Sheikh Ismail Badran, he said, the authentic position is that He, Allah, glorified and exalted be He, possesses hearing, sight, will, speech, power. That befits his majesty, glorified and exalted be he. He is without likeness, without howness, without stripping away the attributes. This is the theology of Muslim orthodoxy and the first three generations. Close quote. So this is where we have reached today from what the Sheikh has said. He gave us this excellent quote from our Sheikh, Sheikh Ismail Badran. Right, so we understand from this then that the first three generations and whatever that they handed down that's permitted to make Tetwil in, they've handed down to us. And whatever they said was valid, they handed down to us. Now, in terms of the topic of the Sifat of Allah and the Ayat of the Quran and the Ayat uh, or the uh, Ahadith of Sifat, okay, this is a topic that is very clear in terms of what is uh, discussed. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the sifa, there it, it depends on what the description is. So if it's a sifa where he's attributed something to himself, like for example, the Kaaba is sometimes called Bayt Allah, house of Allah. That attribution to himself is not a sifa and that he possesses this as a name. But this is a sifa of tashrif. It's an honorable, so he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attributed or in Surah Al-Shams, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Na, uh, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ هَذَا نَاقَةُ اللَّهِ right? uh, نَاقَةُ اللَّهِ وَسُقِيَاهَا This is the she-camel of Allah. That doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an attribute like an animal or anything like that. In reality, uh, this is actually referring to a uh, sifa of tashrif. So this idafa, which is known as the idafa construction, because... It's a possessive form where you're saying this is the she camel of Allah. Or if you said in English the other way, Allah's she camel, right? This is an idafa construction, right? But it's understood from this idafa construction that this is an idafa construction of tashrif, right? But then you have other idafa constructions, right? So you have uh, yad Allah, right? The yad or hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are things that belong to ayat sifat or ahadith sifat And what's agreed upon to be ayat sifat and ahadith sifat are clear. They've been laid down by the first three generations that, yes, these are sifat that belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other things, these other things are not sifat, but they are attributions that are idafa because of tashrif. 
And so this is an important area, an important topic. Uh, it's only the Khalaf that began to go into the area of the uh, Ahadith and Ayat al-Sifat and started to uh, exaggerate in these in these regards. And that's why the I'tiqad al-Salaf, uh, the, the, um, the Najat al-Khalaf, the I'tiqad al-Salaf, this is why the salvation of the latter day generations is in following the creed of the first three generations. So I'll pause here and I say, Subhanakallahumma bihamdika wa ashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa yatubu ilayk. Innahu ghafurur rahim, 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 wa la ilaha illa Allah. Wassalamu alaykum.